Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. Today's episode was taped live in front of a virtual audience as part of a series of episodes examining the relationship between climate and security. These episodes are produced in partnership with CGIAR, the world's largest global agricultural innovation network. The episode today, which is the sixth in our series, examines how to achieve climate security through strengthening partnerships across sectors, disciplines, and geographies. You'll hear me introduce the episode before I moderate a discussion among some fascinating panelists. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. My name is Mark Leon Goldberg. I'm the editor of UN Dispatch and host of the Global Dispatches podcast. Today's conversation about a partnership agenda for climate security is being recorded as a live taping of the podcast. This is now the sixth episode in our climate security series. The previous episodes have all explored different aspects of the relationship between climate and security, and there's still, of course, much more to learn about the contours of those links, but by now we can clearly stipulate that there are deep connections between climate variability, conflict, and security. Our goal for today's conversation is to set an agenda for what to do about those linkages. Fortunately, the Sustainable Development Goals do give us something of a framework, specifically the final goal, number 17, which calls for strengthening partnerships in the service of advancing common goals around climate, peace, and security. To that end, our webinar today will be a solutions-focused conversation aimed at exploring how partnerships across sectors, disciplines, and geographies might advance a climate security agenda. Now, I am very pleased to introduce our panel today. Robert Malley is president and CEO of the International Crisis Group. Welcome. Claudia Sadoff is executive management team convener and managing director, research, delivery, and impact at CGIAR. Welcome. Hans Olaf Ebeck is Director, Section for Energy, Climate, and Food Security at the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Welcome. And Frank Bousquet is Senior Director for Fragility, Conflict, and Violence at the World Bank. Now, with that, let us dive right into this conversation. And Robert Malley, to kick things off, I have a three-part question for you, if you'll indulge me. Uh, First, can you just give us your top-line take on how climate change affects security? And following on that, how can complex security challenges that are influenced by climate change best be addressed? And then finally, can you say a word about the connection between climate security and shortcomings in governance? Well, first, thanks, thanks for having me, and uh, it's great, great to be back on, on the podcast. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions in, in one. I'll try to be brief because I know we want to have a, a good conversation. I'll start just with one of those statistics that people always always mention but, and, and which caught my attention when Crisis Group decided to, to, to delve much more deeply into the connection between climate change and security, which is that, according to economists, a rise in local temperature about half a degree Celsius is associated with a 10 to 20% increase in the risk of deadly conflict. And that statistic is, has, is controversial, has, has been contested, but the point is that there is almost undeniably, I would say undeniably a connection between you know, great changes in, 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 in temperature, um, rainfall, availability of arable land, and, and conflict, because we know that conflict is generated by uh, competition for scarce resources and, and, and climate change, by definition, affects the availability, availability of those resources. And we have done work, uh, as others have, in terms of the competition for resources in northern Nigeria between herders and farmers competing for the same amount of land when, when the, la- that, 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 the, the arable land and the land that both can use is shrinking. 
you could think of uh, you know another case um, the, the the fight over the 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 great the, the, the dam um, the Grand Renaissance Ethiopian Dam, which is at least partly being uh, you know propelled by the fact that there's less rainfall, there's less water, and so there's more competition for that resource. Uh, you could look at what the impact that uh, climate change is having on, in Central America, pushing migration up north, but also as a result, leading to greater role for criminal gangs and therefore for violence and conflict. So I think that connection, which is one that, you know, which has brought together these two communities, the climate change community and the, and the national security and the security community, is one that is well established. I think I'd put two caveats to get to, to, to the other parts of your questions. One caveat is even if there were no security uh, implications for climate change, we should care about climate change. This is obviously, for those of us in the, in the foreign policy world, it is an added reason, but you wouldn't need that reason to understand that climate change is an existential threat. The other one, which goes to, to I think, uh, the latter part of your question, yes, climate change makes a big difference, and it makes a big difference on the likelihood of conflict. But what we have found is that you know, you're not going to wait till you tackle the problem of climate change, that is an urgent task, but you know it's gonna take some time to reduce the carbon footprint. But in the meantime, what you can do is take care of governance issues because in all the cases I mentioned, there, there are other cases where you have the same resource competition that have not led to conflict because you have better mechanisms of governance, accountability, transparency, resource distribution, mediation, all the things that make resource competition less violent, managed in a different way, or diplomacy in the case of Ethiopia, Egypt, Sudan, there, you know, you could think of diplomacy to, to regulate a problem that otherwise could be dealt with through means of war. So there is a connection. It's a connection that is, that I think we see evidence of more and more, which is why this partnership is so important. But for us at Crisis Group and for others, let's not forget that governance is at the core of, of how you tackle the problem of climate change. Okay. As you as you work to, to to tackle climate change itself. Thank you, thank you, uh, Robert, Claudia, Sadaf. I'd like to turn to you now. Uh, you know, climate change is a reality that you deal with every day in your work. And as an aside, I would encourage people to read a report you co-authored called "Pursuing Water Security in Fragile Contexts." Uh, can you briefly tell us about CGIA's? Uh, Pardon me. Can you briefly tell us about CGIAR's engagement on land water food systems and how the institution may align its work in support of sustainable goal number 16? That's the goal in promoting peace and ending violence. Uh, I suppose more to the point, what does agriculture, seeds, soil, and water have to do with peace and security? Thank you, Mark. Well, the CGIR is going through a period of reform at the moment, and we're creating a much more unified and integrated system that will be able to better address the rising and more complex interrelated challenges around agriculture. And this is where we move toward answering your question about the connection to peace and security. The new mandate, for example, of the CGIR is ending hunger through science to transform food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. And this really captures the fact that both food, land, and water systems are not only inseparable within themselves, but they lie very deeply intertwined with quote, climate, as well as poverty, equity, biodiversity, conservation, and a host of challenges that uh, we're facing at the moment. But the issue is that we see food security and social stability and peace and security as all very mutually reinforcing. We know historically the concept of food riots, bread riots, a lack of food, a lack of a stable, secure food source is deeply destabilizing in, in, any, uh, in any community at any point in history. But in relation to climate, the links are actually very interesting. On the mitigation side, for example, we know that agriculture is a real driver of climate change, while in fact agriculture could really provide a sink for a lot of the greenhouse gases that are driving the changes we're seeing. So our forests, our wetlands, our peatlands, our soils, these are all crucial carbon sinks, but they're rapidly being degraded and converting, convert, converted often for agriculture. So the CGIR is seeking solutions to better manage these risks and opportunities and to enhance productivity and resilience at the landscape level through better agricultural processes. Importantly, on the adaptation side of agriculture as well, 
particularly in dry lands and in rain-fed agriculture areas where the, uh, the majority of poor and vulnerable farmers work globally. We see that space as both a primary and very predictable focus for disruption from climate change. And it's these disruptions, the inability of farmers uh, to feed themselves and therefore food systems, it's their inability to adapt to climate change that presents a real opportunity for the CG and other scientists to contribute not only to climate, but to security. So when you ask specifically, what do seed, soil and water have to do with peace and security? It's because food insecurity, hunger, drought, famine, these are threat multipliers. They're also stressors that weaken the community's ability to respond to the other disruptions that we see in conflict and violence affected places. So our scientists work to build more sustainable systems, seeds that are more drought and flood tolerant, water and land management practices that provide greater resilience against drought and flood and changing rainfall patterns, rising temperatures, crop insurance schemes and safety nets that help farmers to get back on their feet more quickly and help maintain food security. So we see these resilient food systems as essential to building the resilience of communities, not only to withstand climate shocks, but to uh, withstand the other disruptions that we see in fra fragile and conflict affected spaces. Uh, thank you, thank you. And now I, I want to turn to Frank Busquet, but uh, first, uh, Frank, I want to make sure you're on the line. I am. Great, excellent. Well, thank you. Well, well, welcome. Uh, so, uh, Frank Bousquet, the new World Bank's strategy for fragility, conflict, and violence uh, maps out a broader and more proactive role for the World Bank in fragile contexts, perhaps even to the realm of preventative action. Uh, can you please tell us and help us understand the main tenets of this strategy and why the need for it now? How does this strategy help chart the way ahead for the bank when facing the combined consequences of climate and conflict? Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, sorry for arriving a little bit late. Now, listen, fragility, conflict, and violence uh, are clearly at the cornerstone of the World Bank Group agenda. Uh, as you may know, the first SDG uh, clearly say, what we need to do for in terms of ending extreme poverty by 2030. But we cannot do that without a sharp focus on those countries that are impacted by fragility, conflict, and violence. And the reason is clear. Forecast is that by 2030, two thirds of those living in extreme poverty are expected to live in what we call FCV, so uh, fragility, conflict, and violence affected settings. And the challenge has been even uh, been enhanced by COVID-19. Uh, where we have an additional 20, 30 million people that are expected to fall into extreme poverty in those countries just this year. So uh, clearly for us, we are focusing on uh, those countries because it's where extreme poverty is significantly increasing, but also we have a strategy because it helps us to be even more effective on the ground and to ensure that we can build on all the progress made in different situations to have a more differentiated approach. And in this context, we have actually four, five area that I would like to, to emphasize that is guiding the way we design operation, supervise operation, and partner with other actors in a way that we have not necessarily done always uh, in the past. So the link with climate security, I think is quite important. Why the strategy is closely linked to the climate change, climate security topics? Well, because climate change is a threat multiplier. It aggravates already fragile situation, overwhelmed state institutions, and also contributes in some case to social uh, upheaval and even violent conflicts. We have all the numbers that you know, by 2030, climate impacts will push an additional 100 million people into poverty. Overall, today, 65% of conflicts currently have a significant land dimension, which is important to note, because uh, we have also a number of conflicts that are around freshwater dimension. So all that is very closely linked to uh, climate change, climate security. Uh, now, what uh, are we focusing on? The first focus on this strategy is about prevention. So over the past decades, you know, the bank was set up. Uh, in fact, the first country that benefited from World Bank support was my home country, France, after the reconstruction, during the reconstruction of the Second War. But the bank progressively moved from purely reconstructions to actually working across the fragility spectrum. So the bank, and that's very clear on the strategy, 
recognize the importance of development support, not only on reconstruction, but also during conflict, during crisis. We are $1.7 billion support in Yemen as we speak, but also there is an important role on prevention. Prevention, what does that mean? It's really seeking to support government to prevent violent conflicts by addressing drivers of fragility and also long-term risk, including climate change. And we have actually a number of programs, I would say some in the Sahel regions, for instance, where we are supporting pastoral communities in six countries so that they can adapt uh, to climate impact on their livelihoods. We have a major program uh, which is called the Regional Sahel Pastoralism Support Projects, $248 million, where we basically integrate mechanism to mitigate conflicts between farmers and herders around the access of land and water. So as you can see, this prevention agenda, and we have significant financing, I could say more beyond, is really about how can we, from a development perspective, make sure that government are focusing on short-term and long-term risk and addressing grievances that in many cases are also linked to uh, climate change. So that's Thank really you. a very powerful message. And that Thank has you. to be done from a development perspective. I will stop there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I want to bring in Han, Hans Olaf Ibrek uh, to this conversation. First, as a, a senior Norwegian diplomat, I feel obliged to congratulate you to your election to the Security Council. Norway uh, will begin a two-year term as a non-permanent member of the Security Council in 2021. And, and I mention that because Norway has long been a, a champion of combining climate and security issues. So uh, I'm curious to learn from you and from your perspective uh, Norway's position right now as it enters the Security Council on how to best merge climate change and peace and security conversations. And also from your perspective, not only as a senior diplomat, but also as a scientist, is the policy science framework in place appropriate or perhaps sufficient to deal with the complex nature of these types of conflicts? Thank you very much, uh, Mark. It's uh, great to be, uh, be with you and the other panelists uh, on this uh, webinar. I would also like to congratulate uh, CJRR for convening this uh, web webinar. So I think this is an excellent vehicle for all of us to engage as many as uh, possible on this uh, important uh, topic. It is a complex uh, issue, and uh, my previous uh, the previous speakers have already outlined uh, some of the factors that we will be discussing uh, quite well. From the outset, I would, of course, uh, like to say that partnerships uh, will be essential to underpin our work uh, to find out what to do with, uh, with climate change and, and security. But let me say, from the, from the beginning of our first line of defense is to achieve the Paris targets. Uh, we need to do whatever we can in order to re reduce emissions as quickly as possible. And we all need to raise our ambitions. As has been mentioned uh, already, uh, climate change is a systemic risk, is a risk multiplier, even it's been called a threat multiplier. And for us, uh, the risk that climate change uh, impacts uh, post to international peace and security are real and present. And this has also been underscored by the previous panelists. And I'm also pleased to note that there seems to be gen more or less general agreement that climate related security risks will increase and multiply in the future. And of course, the implications of this is that without appropriate action, that climate change will mean more fragility, most likely less peace and less security. So this is a big task for all of us and managing these security risks requires actions from all actors, also from the entities responsible for maintaining international peace and security, including the UN Security Council. What hasn't been mentioned so far by the previous panelists, but I think we also need to look at this is that we need to explore how climate change is also an opportunity and not only as a risk uh, or threat because uh, cooperation on on uh, climate change issue environmental issues could also be an entry point to negotiations between parties in conflict uh, so there's currently little focus on climate change on and environmental issues in mediation efforts uh, and I'm not uh, really aware of good examples where climate change has been a factor in peace negotiations we need to integrate them, the climate lens into our mediation efforts and prevent the, the diplomacy. And we need them also to climate proof. And also I would like to underscore conflict proof over climate activities. On the question whether the policy science framework is, is in place is in place is appropriate. I think the short answer is no. 
our capacity to assess and manage climate-related security risks lag behind the changing risk landscape, and we need a comprehensive approach that includes a broader suite of environmental-related security risks and their impacts. It's really important to underscore that risks are highly context-specific, and a country, society, or community's resilience and coping ability will determine the impact of climate change on peace and security. So then our work has to build on multi and interdisciplinary research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to turn back to uh, Claudia Sadoff. You know, earlier you referenced that CGIAR is engaged or engaged in a, a portfolio review on all of its work from the angle of conflict. Can you give us some key examples of the work that the CGIAR is doing with direct relevance on climate security? What does this tell us about the way forward? And as a scientific institution, uh, why is the CGIAR actively seeking to partner with policy and operational actors in the field of climate security? Great, thank you. It's been actually fascinating. The group that is uh, organizing and supporting this webinar has been doing a review of the ongoing CGR portfolio and has found that a tremendous amount of the work that we do relates directly to climate and security. It's not surprising because as an agricultural research for development organization, we work in poor countries where a very large and unfortunately growing number of the extremely poor reside in conflict affected spaces. And we work in agriculture where, where there is a great focus of, of climate impacts. So what we find is that in terms of the investments that are being explored in fragile and conflict affected places, we see tremendous opportunities for co-benefits across this humanitarian and development spectrum through investments in agriculture and food security. The World Bank tells us, for example, that growth in the agriculture sector is two to four times more effective in raising incomes among the poorest compared to other sectors. It's an employment rich space and it's very stabilizing. But here are some examples of the type of work that CGR is looking into very briefly that help uh, to, to, to benefit uh, across this, this spectrum of, of needs. So for example, to directly promote livelihoods in fragile communities, CGR has been working with Colombia's Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development and their uh, Research Center for Sustainable Agricultural Production Systems to address the intricacies of the relationship between deforestation, climate change, and peace by creating sustainable rural livelihoods in areas that are emerging from armed conflict. So this links those objectives of zero deforestation, climate adaptation, and peace building quite directly and provides livelihoods and stability to strengthen capacity and awareness around the dynamics between responses to climate and security. The CG is collaborating now with Wageningen University and SIPRI, the Stockholm Peace Research Institute, to launch the first ever PhD program in climate security. First batch of students are starting this fall. They'll be focusing on the Sahel. As Frank mentioned, this is an area of, of great fragility and on the Asian deltas, very much under threat of, of climate change. And the program will connect explicitly conflict, climate, and the complexity around the theory and thinking and ways to elicit new approaches to uh, address these issues. And finally, we also work directly to create programs enhancing resilience to shocks related to climate that can be triggers for downward cycles of violence. So for example, the CG is developing drought and flood forecasting and monitoring systems to inform national systems for early warnings, early actions, and agricultural advisories. And these systems support risk management and decrease pressure on rural livelihoods um, in areas that are conflict prone or fragile to avoid situations in which those can trigger and stress and become threat multipliers in fragile contexts already. So we're quite interested in this discussion to explore ways in which we we can work with partners to find designs um, and opportunities based on evidence and uh, good science that can help other vulnerable communities to be more resilient. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Franck Bousquet, I'd like to turn back to you. Uh, can you help us understand the scope of the World Bank's engagement worldwide on conflict-related contexts? Uh, relatedly, can you give us some examples of partnerships that the World Bank has forged in 
these conflict-related contexts. Uh, facing climate security challenges, what other partnerships do you see emerging in the future or are currently emerging now uh, that you see as particularly strategic? Thank you very much. It's good to talk uh, after Claudia, who knows very well the, the, the bank. And, you know, talking about strategic partnership, I think this is actually key to strengthening uh, climate security. I mean, one of the most important efforts is exactly the role played by CGIR, which is really to produce some regular analysis that helps to inform how climate dynamics are evolving in a timely manner. So I think we need to partner with uh, all different partners. It's not only about humanitarian development, security actors, it's about academics and different centers. So anyway, that's one notion about the partnership, which is essential. Before talking about the financing, I mean, I think for me, I would like to actually focus more on the partnership uh, because we realize that in this type of settings, uh, well, it's very clear. You need to partner with people that don't look like uh, yourself. You need to partner with organizations that are CSO on the ground, international, local, that have better proximity to the most uh, poorest and the most marginalized and vulnerable communities. So partnership, as you may have seen in the strategy, is clearly something very important. You cannot provide development in Central Africa Republic if you don't partner with the peacekeeping with MINUSCA. Otherwise, you provide support in Bangui. And guess what? When you are looking at the peace agreement of the government with 49 groups, what you want to do is actually to strengthen the capacity, the accountability, the legitimacy and the presence of the states in area where it has not been present. And therefore, the whole point is to be partnering, not necessarily with development actors, bilateral actors, but with those organizations that have the presence and the intelligence and the understanding of what population needs are in those remote areas. So I think it's kind of a call for humility about realizing that without partnering with organizations that are security, peace building, CSO uh, uh, mandates, with different mandates, the development aid is not as effective. So we have been partnering over the past few years significantly, for instance, with UN agencies. In Yemen, for instance, we are working with UN agencies to implement projects during the country's civil war, even though we don't have a staff on the ground. Uh, UNICEF, for instance, we have implemented an emergency cash transfer program uh, that has provided support to help about 9 million uh, people among the most vulnerable. Uh, in Central Africa Republic, I was, I was mentioning this partnership with the MINUSCA, which is so important, all the peacekeeping missions. In Somalia, we are partnering, for instance, with the ICRC to deliver life-saving support uh, in the face of famine risk, very closely linked, by the way, to the whole climate change and the climate security agenda. We're also working with the ICRC in South Sudan. And last but not least, we are focusing also on forced display population clearly understanding that we need to support those countries that are hosting refugees. 90% of them, by the way, are developing countries. And we need to support with organizations that have a mandate, that have the expertise, that complement what we are doing. If we are looking at forced displacement, just as a concrete example, again, of this partnership with other organizations, forced displacement, it's really an issue which is both humanitarian, but also long-term. Uh, refugees are not staying for six months or one year, they're staying four, five, six, seven years in a country hosting them. So this is a protracted crisis that requires to break silo. And that's why we have been partnering significantly with organizations such as UNHCR, so that we can not only provide financing, but also so that we can help countries to have the capacity to keep opening their borders, which is very challenging. And therefore, having the mandate of UNHCR, but also the mandate of development actors like the bank, I think helps in terms of making a difference on the ground. So this whole point about partnership is essential. And yes, on the financing, but I wanted to come to the financing later on because, you know, you can put financing if you don't have the necessarily the right approach, it's not always useful. We have, of course, scaling up. Those countries are those countries are the ones that have seen an, an increase in extreme poverty. And therefore, we are walking the talk and we have about $25 billion over the next three years that will be dedicated to countries that are impacted by fragility, conflict or violence. But it's not only just financing, once again, it's about making sure that we are trying to be effective on the ground by reaching out to other organizations when needed, but also that we are focusing on clear area that requires significant scale up from their point perspective. Prevention was one aspect which is new, but also I would say forced displacement, remaining engaged in conflict uh, and helping countries to moving out of fragility. I will stop here. Uh, thank you. And, and Frank, I think that uh, tees up my question for Hans-Olaf Ibrek uh, very 
very nicely. Uh, you mentioned, Frank, uh, the need to develop partnerships at a very local level. I know Norway uh, does that, uh, but Norway also has engaged over the years on regional partnerships and strengthening security and development institutions at the regional level, particularly in Africa. Can you just tell us more about the work Norway has done in this area, focusing perhaps on your work with the African Union and similar regional institutions? And what does that work tell us about the work ahead in the Security Council? Thank you. Um, there is some emerging recognition that climate change is uh, transforming and redefining the security and development landscape in many countries in, in Africa. I think it's also quite clear that this is the region where it has been easiest to get acceptance that climate change is a security issue and a security risk issue. Um, as many of you are aware of, the language has been included in several uh, resolutions by the UN Security Council. We have it in Lake Chad, Somalia, Mali, West Africa and the Sahel, just to mention a few of them. We have, as you said, Mark, supported various activities uh, across the continent. Uh, one example being our support to activities in uh, West Africa and the Sahel. Through the UN Climate uh, Security Mechanism, uh, we will support activities to strengthen the evidence base for climate-related security links, to establish partnerships with sub-regional actors, including research uh, institutions, and to enhance capacities of UN and non-UN partners, including government, civil society, and the private sector. And we have also provided substantial support to, to AU to put this issue on the, the African Union, to put this issue on, on their agenda as well. In the Security Council, as well as in the African Union, issues related to climate change have been divisive, at times both in substantive as well as procedural issues. I think it's important then to note that 10 of the largest peace operations deployed by the UN Eight of them are actually located in countries most exposed to climate change, and the topic then therefore remains relevant and important. So this is a key reason that we made this as one of our four priority areas uh, during our period in the Secu Security Council. For us, it is important to have reliable, relevant, consistent and actionable information on climate-related peace and security risks that can facilitate our work in the Council. And as part of our preparations, uh, we have undertaken a preliminary assessment of the available information and, anal and analysis. And I think it would, uh, would be useful to share some of the findings of this uh, analysis, because our findings indicate that they, the studies uh, at times lacked coherence across products, which made it difficult to compare and draw lessons. Many of them lacked continuity in analytical structure, categories and indicators across countries. There's also lack of credible, reliable data. We also lack analysis relevant and actionable for the debates and negotiations in the Security Council. And let me really underscore that point. We need to make sure that we have the relevant and actionable information that we can feed into uh, the work when you're preparing resolutions and in the debates in the Security Council. Generally also, there are many of the studies suffered from a lack of conceptual clarity and consistency, and also a shared understanding of terminology and a shared view of the role of this council in relation to climate-related security risk. And so for us, this is, these issues are important to take forward when we develop our own research agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Robert Malley, I want to turn to you. you know, I personally often rely on International Crisis Group for understanding conflict. I just yesterday I published a podcast episode about the Dagorno con uh, Karabakh uh, conflict based on an interview I had with a crisis group uh, analyst. So even as I look to the crisis group for understanding conflicts as they exist today, I also know that you are charting a path forward for how we understand conflicts of the future. And your economics of conflict project, I think, is a, is a good example of this. Can you tell us more about that project? And do you see possible linkages with climate security priorities in terms of research and policy? And would there need to be a similar sort of engagement on climate security issues as well? So first, I want to say, I mean, for me, this panel is really the example of how different fields come together and produce uh, more knowledge and more. Uh, I mean, this, you know, you brought together, I think, people from different fields, different outlooks. I think it's been very, uh, really a great conversation. I want to react to two things I heard and, and, and come to what you said first. Although Hans made a very good point that there are opportunities uh, as well, and we shouldn't, it's not just a matter of looking at the downsides. And some of the opportunities 
and we've been thinking about where have been the good news stories. I mean, it's true that in Africa, IGAD has made this a priority and the African Union has made it a priority in the Horn of Africa to look at the issues of, of, of resource scarcity and, and, and of cooperation to try to address that. And I think we have to be more cognizant of areas where this could serve as a tool of, of conflict resolution in a way if, when, when, when different countries or actors are in competition for the same scarce resources. Um, the other point, uh, and Frank, Everything you said of it was, was 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 really very extremely important and useful. And just to to, to signal, and he may not know this, but our teams met this morning uh, <laughs> uh, to talk about potential uh, partnership in in West Africa. I think uh, to deal with this issue of climate change and and, and security uh, locally. And that brings me to, to 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 what we are doing and how we're trying to to take our organization, which is. I mean, it's, its whole methodology has been field-based, looking at regional conflicts, looking at regional actors, and trying to understand at the most granular level what are the motivations, the interests, and the possibilities of conflict resolution at that you know at, at that micro level. I think what we have found, and you know, maybe we're late to the game when it comes to climate change, but whether it's climate change or economics of conflict, that those are factors that we're going to have to increasingly take into account into our, our analysis of conflict dynamics and bring them all together. Uh, and again, I think what we heard today was how the overlap between economic drivers of conflict exacerbated by climate change and exacerbated or not by good or bad governance. In other words, it really is th those three levels. You know, it starts with the, the drivers of conflict, um, which are often driven by uh, uh, competition for uh, scarce economic resources or not sometimes not even scarce economic resources, just new resources that people are competing for and then exacerbated by climate change, and then again, made better or worse by the by the governance, which is where, where our expertise is on the politics and the governance, but we're trying to add that economic dimension and that climate dimension, which we know we could only fully do in partnership with others who have that expertise. And we bring in that, that, that granular understanding of how economic factors and political factors are, um, are driving conflict. So yes, those are, there's, I'd say there are three areas where we're expanding. One is climate change. The other is uh, economics of conflict. The third, which is for another discussion, is on technologies, uh, whether it's information warfare, artificial intelligence, drone. That's the third one. But the other two are really relevant to, to this conversation. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I open this discussion by emphasizing the need for a solutions-based conversation. So I think we're coming into what I perceive to be the most important question of this conversation. I'm going to pose uh, the same question to each of you. Uh, moving forward and taking into account the reality of climate change and conflict and cognizant of the potential partnerships among institutions represented on this very call, uh, such as CGR, uh, World Bank, UN, Crisis Group, and leading donors, what could be two things that you would prioritize in terms of institutional frameworks, joint engagements, or common agendas when dealing with climate change and conflicts? In other words, what are two ways we can work better together and across di disciplines? Uh, and Frank, I, I will start with you. So, I mean, it builds on what, uh, you know, uh, Rob said before. I mean, we are actually relying more and more, and I think moving forward, it would be very important on organizations that have totally different mandate. Uh, ICG provides situation report in the Sahel or in many other countries that are extremely important for us to adjust our operation. So I think moving forward, it's important to adapt our way of working to the fluidity of the situation. Look at if we had this panel six months or I would say a year ago. Uh, I mean, obviously, there would be no mention of COVID. It has changed radically so many things. So I think you know, we need to be much more nimble. Sometimes it's difficult for big organizations, but I think we cannot be efficient without focusing more at the local level and without engaging with organization with totally different mandate. I mentioned the scale up of the bank in terms of partnering with UN agencies, ICRC, humanitarian actors. But of course, as I agree with Rob, it was so important to have this panel today because it's also with CGIAR, it's also with ICG, it's also with bilateral that have intelligence, that have expertise, that may be needed at a certain time in a certain country. So I think it's very important again um, to be more agile, but also to realize uh, moving forward that 
the type of risk that we are facing, short-term drivers of fragility, long-term drivers of fragilities, requires expertise uh, across uh, the silos. We talk a lot about it. We are trying to do it. I can tell you that in the SIL is a good example that Rob mentioned. We are relying on other partners to inform us about the type of risk uh, that are emerging. Uh, and uh, the situation varies rapidly from one month to another one to be able to have better information about where we should be focusing our financing in those areas, so geographically, uh, but also in terms of the content. Uh, this is something new, and this is something that will need to be done more and more moving forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Hans Olav, uh, over to you. W what are two things that you would prioritize in terms of advancing partnerships around climate security agendas? First, uh, let me underscore the point that I made in my previous uh, information that we intervention that we need reliable, relevant, and actionable country and regional information and analysis uh, on climate-related peace and security risk. Uh, and of course, uh, in order to, to to achieve that, we need more and better research and analytical work. Um, all the institutions represented on this panel can actually contribute effectively. Uh, to uh, strengthen our research uh, agenda and deliver the products that we need. Secondly, of course, I've underscored it from the outset, the only way forward is to build partnership because this is a highly multidisciplinary topic. And I think we've been too siloish so far. So we need to build on and strengthen existing networks and to expand them to include in particular researchers from the global south and affected countries. And such a global network could actually be used as a basis for stimulating dialogue among diplomats, researchers, and policymakers, representing a broad and diverse set of views on the interlinkages between climate change, peace, and security. Because we need to generate a, a more and wider shared understanding around climate related peace and security risk. Finally, we also need multilateral cooperation because this is not an issue that we can solve on our, on our own, given that our mitigation response is not adequate and that the climate seems to be changing faster than most scientific models are predicted. We need to develop our multi multilateral response mechanisms. Even though the links between climate change and conflict is contested uh, among many, we as diplomats, we cannot afford to wait until we have our full understanding in order to uh, develop our response toolbox. So we all have a role to play in this um, and the polarizing the debate will not take us where we need to be because we need all hands on the deck. In closing, in terms of moving this agenda forward, maybe I could just summarize it that we need to move the agenda slowly, steadily and forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. And Robert, Mally, to you. Uh, Give us two items, two ideas that you would prioritize in terms of advancing a climate security agenda and partnerships around a climate security agenda. It's hard to add to what Frank and Hans said because I think they said it all and I think really that's that's the way to go. I would just make two points. One, it's not all about resources, but it is also about resources. And uh, to the extent that I know countries are, are facing difficult uh, demands now because of COVID, but there was a pledge in 2000 at the 2011 climate summit uh, to for the developed world to provide I think it was 100 billion annually for climate change adaptation mitigation efforts beginning 2020 and important that they keep that but more important perhaps or as important this is the point I think we just heard uh, from Frank and Hans is that integration and what the way I'd put it is that what would be very important and I think working together you know when people make projections about the impact of climate change they tend to be over many many years I think shortening that timeline and localizing it so that we know more uh, when fluctuations are going to occur and where they're going to hit then you can marry it with the local politics so shortening the timeline localizing the timeline that's what I would uh, I'd say we could all do together uh, thank you. Thank you very much and and Claudia set off uh, I'll give the you the the final word here. What would you recommend? Thank you, Mark. Um, I think the importance of the conversation itself was very clearly demonstrated here today. And I really wanna thank you, Mark, and my colleagues at the CG for organizing this. I think when you bring these different lenses together, it helps us to broaden our perspective, but also to raise our ambitions. We know how much work is needed in climate. We know how much work is needed in conflict and violence affected states. And to, to really remind ourselves that we can do that and more 
if we design carefully to also integrate issues of, of basic development, food security, uh, community stability into, in, into the efforts that we make. And I think that um, the conversation that we've had today also points to ways in which we can more mindfully design interventions through partnerships, as everyone has said, and it's partnerships across scales from the physical science of field based CGIR researchers to the extraordinary complex world of politics and governance that Rob and the ICR grapple with and to integrate that into information that is immediately usable for Hans Olaf in the Security Council, for Frank in the development of uh, World Bank investments uh, to provide that information that is needed and the, the, the potential that is there to do more for these just terribly vulnerable communities that we're all concerned about. Thanks, Mark. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, I'm now going to turn the camera over to Diego for some concluding remarks. Thank you all for your thoughts, and uh, we'll see you next time. Diego, over to you. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. This has been a very uh, interesting discussion, and it's also uh, it is it is a validation of the fact that an interdisciplinary approach is the way to go. Uh, when the CGR decided to engage on this new area, new in the sense that we were working on it, but we were not necessarily fully aware that we were doing it, was because we realized that this knowledge needs to feed, inform, and transform the thinking in the policy areas. I used to be a diplomat, and now I'm working for CGR, and for me, the connection is clear. I take the message from Mr. Mali, it's a matter of governance, it's a matter of how the systems are working. Are the, are the systems connected to the optimal state and what is cracking, what is not functioning? I understand from uh, uh, Mr. Ibrick that we need to have better knowledge and we need to work in a way that uh, allows to at least have the common picture. If we might agree or disagree on what to do, at least we have to agree in terms of what is the situation on the ground. And we're still not there, so there's much work to be done. Uh, from, from Mr. Bousquet, clearly, Partnerships is an essential element and uh, having worked with the bank in the past and seeing it now, it's so refreshing to see that the idea of partnership is expanding, is moving in different areas, is taking it as well in different time, in different elements of the time scale, preventive and proactively addressing things in the future. And with that, I think these partnerships will lead us to a situation in which we might have uh, integrated responses and perhaps doing away with these silos that have been so difficult to, to work with in so many operations, so many development contexts. And for Dr. Sadov, I mean, you, 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 said, you, said, the, you said the path forward. Uh, we have science, we have knowledge, we have understanding of what's going on the ground, and we just want to partner with all of you to ensure that that knowledge becomes actively operational to have better solutions for the future. One thing about climate change and conflict is that it doesn't have a postal code, it doesn't have an address, it's cognitively difficult to grab. And within that context, having a clear picture and having a good understanding of the different dimensions around this very difficult phenomena that is going to be such a great challenge for humanity is, 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 is unique. And we have something to contribute. We basically want to say, let's just get together and let's make it happen. We don't have much time and we have to do it now. Thank you all. All right. Thank you all for listening. That was Diego Osario of CGIAR offering some concluding remarks. To access other episodes in this series, please visit globaldispatchespodcast.com. To sign up for a live recording, please visit the links in the show notes of this episode. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.